Hi, I'm Joanna Valsamis, Director of Knowledge Mobilization at Canada's Stem Cell Network and your host on Stem Cells from the Sofa. In this unique series, I sit down with some of the brightest minds in the field. Today, we're joined by Nika Shakiba, an Allen Distinguished Investigator and Assistant Professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering at the University of British Columbia. Her research program is interested in understanding the social lives of stem cells. Her lab combines the systems and synthetic biology approaches to forward and reverse engineer the interactions between cells and developmental systems. Nika is also co-founder of Advice for Scientists, an online hub providing support to scientists at all stages of their careers. Thank you for joining us today, Nika. Can we talk a little bit about your work on the social lives of stem cells and the impact you hope it will make? Absolutely. So uh, our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, right? So our cells are used to having neighbors. They work together to get things done in the body. And in my lab, we think of stem cells as also living in these multicellular societies. So we want to understand when these cells will cooperate and also when they won't. So when they might compete with each other and when you might get bullies emerging from the midst and how we can control that, leverage that to make regenerative medicine uh, more robust. It's really fascinating to think that the way that stem cells communicate with each other could improve the effectiveness of therapies. Could you talk a little bit more about your work and how it might improve cell therapy manufacturing and lead to better clinical outcomes for patients? Right, so just like our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, oftentimes when we're manufacturing stem cells and trying to derive cellular therapeutics that are gonna go in the body, they're also growing in vats of millions or trillions of cells. And so if there are competitive interactions between cells, for example, there's some bullies and they're eliminating other cells around them, but those other cells will totally fine. They would have functioned properly had we put them in the body, then that's a problem. It reduces the efficiency of that manufacturing process and we get less cells cells out, which makes the costs of the therapy higher. And if we can't predict when there is competition, they might even change the efficiency from batch to batch, which is even worse. If we can't predict and reproduce you know, from batch to batch how we manufacture these cells, then we're not building these manufacturing systems that are ready for Canadians to use and that can actually fit into our single payer healthcare system. We need really robust pipelines. So we wanna understand how these cells influence each other so that we can engineer that as a parameter, right? We can make the process more efficient. We can make the cells fitter perhaps so that they're stronger. And then on the other side, when we actually put these cells in the body, we want cells that can actually stand their ground. So they can't just be wimpy and like, you know, get ca caught up in battles inside the body and get eliminated, right? We want them to stand their ground in our bodies and transplant and be effective as therapies. What inspired you to study the social behavior of cells? And what discoveries are you excited about in the future? I guess I started thinking about this in my PhD. So I remember attending a conference in which one of the presenters was talking about what was emerging as a new kind of field of cell competition. This idea that there could be survival of the fittest, like a Darwinian evolution happening in a cellular system. And they were showing it in the context of early embryonic development. So in the early stages of our growth as little embryos, right, becoming humans, they were showing that there was a, a remarkable amount of competition between the cells. At that time in my doctorate, studies, I study the, the, the like in vitro or cellular equivalent in a dish of embryo cells. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe they're, they're existing in the system too, like they exist in the embryo. So we've got cells that are kind of similar to embryonic cells. Maybe it exists here too. And we looked for it and we found it and it kind of changed my perspective. There was this hidden battle in my cell cultures <laughs> that I wasn't aware of. And so I wanted to now shed more light on that. And, and make it something we can control and not just be surprised by. Mm -hmm. Really cool, that's really amazing work that you're doing. Um, how does your work impact patients and are there re real world applications um, and treatments that will be coming out in the future from this work? Yeah, so we've got some things that are more translationally focused and some that are more basic science and we hope that can have larger impacts down the line. But what I would say more translationally focused, we're trying to understand right now situations in which we're trying to grow lots of, you know, huge vats of stem cells to create trillions of cells that can be enough cells for a therapy, right? We need a lot of cells to transplant into patients. So one of the first steps is to take the stem cells and to grow them up in these bioreactor systems. Now, what happens on the way is that these cells are not used to doing this. They're used to living in our bodies. They don't have to produce like trillions of offspring, right? So as they're doing this in these culture vessels, they go wrong, things go wrong. Their DNA mutates, 
their chromosomes don't segregate properly, you end up with genetic abnormalities in your cells. And um, like cancer, some of these genetic abnormalities are beneficial and those cells take over the whole bioreactor. Um, they outgrow and they outcompete aggressively sometimes the normal cells around them. And this is a problem. We now can't use those abnormal cells for cell therapy. So we are trying to understand situations in which these kind of competitive genetic mutations emerge so that we can detect them early on and even use some new technologies to try to zap them, like get rid of them. Maybe not directly zap <laughs> them, but get rid of them in the culture vessel so that we can continue to produce high quality cells efficiently in a cost-effective way and manufacturing pipelines for cells therapies. Nice. Excellent. That's really exciting. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for joining us on Stem Cells from the Sofa. Take a look at other conversations about access and affordability in clinical trials. <laughs>